If you are familiar with my videos, you may recognize my trusty workhorse I have driven across the country. The Bug. My little green Honda Insight electric hybrid that sneaks into shots sometimes. Delivering up to 90 miles to the gallon, it has allowed me to cheaply and reliably get to locations. But it is tiny, and as I have increased the amount of kit and required more power for charging batteries, I needed to get bigger, and whilst camping in high summer is tolerable, I was forced to drive home after each shoot in colder months, or spend £50 a night in a cheap hotel. Hence van life, or rather bug life too, I have upgraded. So a quick word on buying vans. With two years of COVID restrictions, the demand for either couriers or those wanting a van for staycations has significantly pushed up the price of suitable vehicles for conversion. I used Brightwell's auction house in Herefordshire, who sell off the ex-utility and government stock. I've used them in the past, most recently buying an ex-police sprinter as a conversion base for a build I did for a friend. I made a snap bid on this 2010 Long Wheelbase X Environment Agency Transit with nine months of MOT and only 110,000 miles on the clock. I had put in a low bid of £3,000 only to immediately have bidder's remorse. I read the summary. It turned out that it had an engine fault with a do not drive in the description. It was well below the reserve, and I inquired did I still have to buy it if they accepted the lower bid, uh, which was a yes, so if you're going to shop via auction, read the small print. As it turned out, no other person was foolish enough to outbid me. Brightwell's arranged delivery for £150, so with VAT and fees, the total price was just under £4,000. I wasn't too worried. Transits can have injector faults, and a complete rebuild would be less than £1,000. As it turned out, the assessment was wrong. I ran the engine and discovered it was simply dirt in the fuel line. A good run cleared the lines and the vehicle is running sweetly after a thousand miles. The vehicle report also said the tyres were worn, and with the exception of one, they're almost entirely new, and there's a new tyre on the spare. Just getting a spare is a bit of a luxury. So, on to the build. I wanted a stealth camper, so the amber lights and utility look is perfect. It will allow me to film and camp up without drawing too much attention, and safely do shoots near busy roads. Being an ex-works vehicle for the Environment Agency, it came with some extras. Loads of expensive custom-made shelving, a welfare area with a diesel heater, an electric hot water dispenser for drinks, which I'll probably not use, an electric hand-washing station, a 12-volt microwave, and a massive solar panel. Sadly, the ledger battery and the inverter were removed. My priority is practical camper, not a beautiful one. The first task was to remove the bulkhead, extra seats and shelving, which I would repurpose. Step two is insulation. I have a stock of polyurethane foam boards, which are the better than fibre, all sealed with fixie foam. I use the gun grade stuff and it's great for gaps and nooks and crannies, and cheap at £6 a can. Be liberal filling voids, but take care not to make lock mechanisms and electrics inaccessible. However, fans are difficult to insulate. Glass and steel act as a radiator for both heat and cold. You cannot insulate the cab or the passenger or driver's doors. At best, you can reduce the size of that radiator and the surfaces where water vapour condenses from breathing and cooking and it's worth knowing you will exhale half a litre of water as you sleep, so ventilation is vital. The most expensive purchase in my £1,000 conversion budget is £280 for the large skylight. Smaller and cheaper ones are available, but I also wanted a route to get onto the roof, as well as a flight deck for the drone. And yes, it should point the other way in case it's left open whilst driving. It comes with a blackout when I'm parked up at a car park, and a fly screen for warm nights up in the highlands when the midgets are out. I've used PVC cladding to line up the van. It's cheap, less than £200 for everything, about half the price when compared to wood. It's lighter and can be stuck up with hybrid adhesives, which I can only describe as magical. They are super strong, they have super grab, they bond anything to anything, there's no volatile solvents, 
and it's also insulating. It sets in about an hour, and there's a rapid version that sets in 20 minutes, which is even more magical. By the way, not all glues are equal. Even insulated vans can get very hot in summer. Hot glue, for instance, fails, as does some spray adhesives. Hybrid glues, silicon, PU foam, and PVA are all heat resistant. I have used wood, both new and recycled, to line out camper conversions in the past, but it's heavy, and that will have an impact on fuel consumption and the amount of additional baggage and equipment that can be safely loaded. All vans will have a maximum payload that range from 800 kilos to 1,400, and that will include the 150 kilograms of the passenger and the driver. If you have a 100 litre water tank, then that is another 100 kilograms off the payload. Just one sheet of thick plywood is nearly 40 kilograms, a gas bottle 25, so keep an inventory as you build, and as a rough rule, stick to half the payload for the build, leaving the other half for supplies and provisions. One of the first jobs was to get rid of the double bench seat. New single seats are expensive, but a local scrapyard sells driver's seats for vans for about £50 cash. You have to be choosy, as many are damaged, and pull it out yourself. A set of socket star drives is handy. This, along with the driver's seat, was soaked in washing detergent after being removed, I may add, and jet washed. Both turned out rather nicely. Ford Transits may not be as desirable as VWs or Mercedes, but the engine in the Mark 7 is tough and reliable, and the driver's seat is very comfortable. And they also include a pretty decent sound system. For layout, I needed a second bed for guests, and wanted a permanent bed for myself. I haven't slept in a single bed for decades, and I have reduced the insulation to a minimum, so as to add a few inches, and being six foot, I can manage to stretch out across, almost. I have tried fold-out beds, and the reality is, it's just too much hassle, especially if you just want to crash out in the middle of the day, and you still have to stow away your bedding. Under the spare bed, come bunch, come sofa, I have a compartment for camping gear and other kit, such as wetsuits, and a porta potty It seals up, and I use sawdust to make it a semi bioloo Again, I have had it kicking around, but knew they're about £20. I repurposed some of the shelving for the galley, the hardened sink originally coming out of a caravan, and cut down to size. And free, of course. Caravan scrapyards are a great place to get cheap kit. Waste is another issue for van life. Out in the wilds, there are no litter bins, and you have to take all your rubbish home. Hence, I have this can of plastic crusher and a heavy-duty compression sack to be kept in the garage to take my rubbish home. The tap is a simple well pump for about £40, and there's a five-gallon clean water tank and a waste tank. I'm in two minds about having a built-in water and waste tanks slung underneath, but on this occasion, the other surprise on purchasing this vehicle is that it is an electric assist hybrid with a battery pack and motor taking up that space. This was part of the government's electrification low carbon program from 2010 for some of its vehicle fleets. 140 transits were fitted with this hybrid system that cost a fortune at the time and give some fuel improvement and better performance. For additional storage, I continue with steel, being lighter than wood. I have an old workshop cabinet, and never got used, and it's light and tough and importantly lockable. I repurposed the original lockers to make a secure store above the cab. And for a store for supplies, which again is lockable, I have repurposed this filing cabinet, which again was free. I have a simple bit of old kitchen worktop for making a dining and workspace area. Security is important. Camera and recording kit is expensive to replace. Whilst you cannot stop a determined thief, multiple locks will slow them down and help with contents insurance, and locks stops the drawers flying open. These sock lockers are shoe holders from Ikea. They cost £20 a pair and stay closed when going over bumps. And Ikea also has lots of other cheap storage, like this side shelf, just a £3 plastic box, and these wall organisers, and of course Frack, the Ikea shaving mirror, that featured in the captain's quarters in Battlestar Galactica.
There is some storage space for my surfboard above. In the short term, I am using high-density foam as a window blackout, and also for the flooring. PVC tongue and groove and the other myriad of different profiles can also be made into cupboards and wardrobes. These doors are from boating. I had them in the workshop for another project, but they normally cost between 20 and 30 pounds. And I went for a wardrobe rather than a shower room as a place to store my suits and coats. Over the winter, I also leave this dehumidifier in, and that can be plugged into a makeshift hookup to keep condensation down and the bedding and clothing dry and fresh. The van also came with mobile broadband aerial for vehicle tracking, which plugs in nicely to my own 4G mobile broadband. There's a 400 watt inverter for the laptop and other electricals, some LED lighting, as well as plenty of USB ports, a dual voltage fridge donated to me, and a 2 kilowatt inverter, which is the third most expensive purchase after the Skylight. It's around £200. And I run my bean to cup coffee machine, which is a luxury, but way cheaper than doing Costa Coffee in service stations. The machine is second hand, and I recently replaced it with a new version for my home. And all that power will also be used to charge my e bike and scooter in the garage. So onto the garage. I've repurposed the shelving system to carry the bed and provide plenty of storage, including some cheap garden furniture and a big Coleman's gazebo. There is a power socket, tool storage, gas bottle, and this vice holder that came with a van, which I'm sure I will find handy for some reason. As for hygiene, I skipped on the shower. They take up a lot of space. Having lived off-grid, I've tended to haul wash, as it is known, simply using a basin. Uh, but for warmer months, and for climbing in and out of my wetsuit, I came across this hack. It's a telescopic painter's handle, which can have a camping shower attached to it. And a ground sheet can be attached across the rear doors for privacy. Van life is a series of compromises. Money, size, practicality. For instance, a 4x4 may be tempting, and there are some ex-utility 4x4 vans around, but they guzzle fuel, and the 4x4 facility is rarely used, and in my experience, the twin axle is more than adequate, and is effectively an extra couple of spare wheels in emergencies. A shorter wheelbase would make parking and three-point turning easier, as well as ferry trips cheaper, but I wanted to squeeze in a guest. I had to have a checklist. Affordability and reliability came on top. A practical interior followed with a permanent bed, and then style coming in last. And of course, all within my budget. All in, it's taken about a month to complete. Although it will continue to be work in progress, and I may change some of the design features as I go along, such as the blackout curtains. It is very easy to get sucked into a task of conversion. You lose sight of why you're doing it, which is to get out and experience wonderful countryside, and not win an award for the cutest camper. One thing I will do is tidy up on the debadging. I simply sprayed silver paint over the Environment Agency logo and signage, so when the weather warms up and the plastic softens, I'll peel off the huge stickers and buff up the metallic paint job. So these are my top tips for van builders. Make sure the van part, the engine and the vehicle, is reliable and fuel efficient. There's no point in having a beautiful camper that it breaks down or is too expensive to drive anywhere. Remember, insulation only reduces heat loss or gain, or surfaces that allow condensation. So invest in ventilation and another duvet. Keep the weight of the build to half the vehicle's payload. Have a permanent bed. Consider how you're going to store your rubbish. With no roadside litter bins, you may spend days sharing it in the van with you. And most importantly, build a van for your needs. If it's just you and your dog, well, build a van for you and your dog. So, if you see me parked up, say hello for a chat and freshly brewed coffee, and look out for my upcoming adventures in coming months.